every time I would go to church, literally three words would make me cringe. It was tithes and offerings. Every time I heard it, I would just get so nervous and and just think, oh, I think a lot of it is um, maybe guilt. I'm not giving enough or um, there's no way I can give right now. I didn't understand tithes and offerings and now I, as, as I learned more about tithes and offerings, I learned that they're two separate things. You don't give tithes, you literally bring back tithes to God. That's obedience, it's not generosity. But offerings were where you were generous and that was the part I had a hard time with. For offerings, I want to give offerings. I want to give more than the 10%. That's where it gets hard though because you still have to pay the bills and how much do you give and who do you give to and how do you give and who gets your offerings and who gets your gifts. I mean, you can give to any very worthy charity, but I wanted to give to church um, because you so, I believe you sow where you grow and I grow here. I want to be in a deeper relationship with God. I want to know him more. That's why I come here. And so I really want to give back to God so that I can be more like him in terms of um, being generous because he is so generous. That's why I want to give to him. Uh, good morning. I want to thank Angela for sharing that. Um, you sow where you grow. It's a pretty good line. You also grow where you sow. And I, we, we mentioned this, especially year end time. This is a critical time in the financial uh, season of the church. And I know that m everybody gives for different reasons. Some give at the end of the year because you have extra. Some are giving sacrificially. Some give primarily because they just really believe in the mission of the church. Some give because they're so committed to the kingdom. Some give just simply out of gratitude for God. Most of us give out of some combination of reasons. I know that you give for your own reasons and not for mine, but I want you to know that we take very seriously the trust that you give us when you give to use these things for the advancement of God's kingdom, to help the people that God would have us to help to be uh, God's church. And so we appreciate your gifts, and um, they certainly are, are needed. Um, also, I, again, I want to personally thank those of you who've sacrificed so much to make uh, this uh, drive-through this past week. It's just um, really amazing, the effort that's gone in. I know a lot of people that are tired around here, and so thank you for your service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we um, are in awe at what you did that first Christmas. And it's impossible for me to do justice. Um, but I know that your Holy Spirit can work in this place so we can experience your presence and walk more closely with you and know Jesus as Savior. Through Christ we pray. Amen. We almost take it for granted that even though it's been 2,000 years since Jesus was born, no birthday in history continues to change the world and enjoy such universal acceptance as the birth of Christ. I mean, I was thinking about it recently. Galileo is considered the father of modern science. But was last time you exchanged cards saying, Happy Galileo's birthday? George Washington, the father of our nation. But I can't tell you the last time somebody gave me a gift saying, happy Washington's birthday. Abraham Lincoln is considered by many to be the greatest president in American history, and yet in his birthday we don't put up lights and we don't sing songs of 
praise and joy. It doesn't change. His birthday, his month, the month of his birthday doesn't change the spirit for all those weeks. There's something powerful. There's something special that happened 2,000 years ago, isn't there? I think it began with the announcement of the angel as recorded in Luke chapter 2, verse 10, where the angel said, don't be afraid for, look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the city of David, a Savior has been born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. Norman Vincent Peale said, Christmas waves a magic wand over the world, and behold, everything is softer and more beautiful. It's true. Why? I don't know what words stand out to you from that pronouncement today, but I tell you the words that stand out to me this day. The words, great joy and Savior. Jesus has come, and boy, if there's one thing that we experience at Christmas time, it's great joy because Jesus is Savior. I want for you to leave this place. But, do we live at a time when people need joy? Do we not live in a time when people feel oppressed and discouraged and lonely and sad? Well, I want us to walk out of here, not just with great joy, but a confident joy. Because we know what it means that Jesus, that God has come into this world in the form of His Son, and He is Savior. There are a lot of reasons why people struggle with joy and confident joy in Jesus. I think one that is becoming prevalent today is because there's just so much increased skepticism. For most of 2,000 years, nobody questioned the historical veracity of Jesus' existence, but that's becoming more popular these days. And in fact, if you want to be part of the cool kids, maybe you, that's kind of what you'll You won't be too, you know, sure about Jesus. Maybe you believe, maybe you don't. I read an article recently of an atheist who said the reasons... Jesus never existed. The reason I believe Jesus never existed. And as I read the article, <clears throat> I kept thinking, well, that's not true. That statement's not true. That's not historically accurate. Well, that's deceptive. And it occurred to me at the end of the article, I thought, there are going to be a lot of people that go to church, a lot of people who consider themselves Christians, that may be discouraged by this and start to have some unnecessary doubts because this guy is counting on people not knowing the facts of history or, quite frankly, having such sloppy reasoning that they can't see the illogic, the unreasonable nature of his arguments. We can know, we can be confident in Jesus as Savior because we can know he actually lived in time and space in history. It really happened. One of the arguments that they'll make is, well, nobody ever wrote about Jesus outside the, 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 the New Testament. Not true. I could uh, take an hour to share with you the evidence for the existence of Jesus. I know because in my first draft of this message, I took about an hour probably to explain this stuff. No, I'll spare you of that, but I, I could list for you just immediately at least 11, there are probably like 13 cases outside the New Testament, like Josephus, the New Testament, the first century Jewish historian, uh, the, 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 the Jewish Talmud that mentioned Jesus. We can just look at the Scripture itself. The Scripture is not written like like, um, like legend or myth. In fact, I think today I'm probably going to record some devotions to go into this a little bit in more depth if you want to follow those. But just read the account of Jesus' birth from Luke chapter 2, for instance. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So everybody went to be registered, each to his own town. Now, does that read like once upon a time? This is talking about real people in history. Caesar Augustus, this is not like something out of Harry Potter, sent a, c c decreed a registration. You can actually look into that. If you want to know about the dating of Jesus' birth and why they're confused about that, I talked about that in a devotional last week. But very likely this was a registration called by Caesar in about 5 or 6 B.C. Talk about real places, Syria, real governors, Quirinius. The entire Bible is written 
as history. Where it touches on history, it expects to not just be taken seriously, but to actually just examine it, see if what we're not claiming is true. One of the claims that, they, that, that an atheist will make is, well, n- nobody wrote about Jesus who was an eyewitness. Really? John, who writes the book of John, says, I've written to you about what I've seen and heard. Peter, whose writing, whose, whose, whose experiences, whose, whose knowledge of Jesus was basically penned by Mark in the book of Mark, Peter says, we did not share with you cleverly invented myths when we shared with you the majesty that we, exper- that we saw. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Over and over again in the Bible, we see that kind of stuff. It just does not read like myth. You can be confident that Jesus is Savior who lived in real history. Because the facts just back it up. The reason backs it up. You can actually go to the places where Jesus walk. Did you know that? You can go to Nazareth where Jesus grew up. I've walked there. Um, Archaeologist Ken Dark at the University of Reading in England spent more than a decade studying the first century ruins and records of the earliest, the earliest pilgrimage to Nazareth. Not religious pilgrimages, the family pilgrimages to Nazareth. Family knew where Joseph was and Mary lived in Nazareth, and that's where family would return. He says, I didn't go to Nazareth to find the house of Jesus. Nobody could have been more surprised to find it than me. It's very close to the place, the church, where they have um, to demarcate it, but it's actually underneath the Sisters of Nazareth Covenant. The first time I was in Israel, we, um, my wife and I were able to get under there. We went after hours and just got lucky. It's like you, you hand a five spot to the right person and they let you in. And so we were able to walk through and it's like, wow, I've been back several times. They don't let us in ever again. Um, but you can go with us next year. We, if, if, if COVID allows us, we're going to go next December. You can go to the place where Jesus was crucified and be confident this is where Jesus was crucified. How do we know? We're not quite as confident about the tomb, although we're, we know the rough, roughly the right area for another reason. But the reason we know this one is because when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70, one of the things they wanted to do was expunge the memory of Jesus from history. So what did they do? They desecrated the places that had been set aside to remember Jesus did this here. This happened to Jesus here. Jesus performed this miracle here. And sometimes what they would do is build a pagan shrine on it. So at Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified, they built a pagan shrine to Aphrodite. So a couple of centuries later, Helena is going around trying to find, locate the places where Jesus did various things and they she comes to Jerusalem and they say they say oh we know where he was crucified the Romans put they built this pagan shrine to Aphrodite on top of it so by trying to expunge Jesus from history they actually marked the places where Jesus did certain things thank you silly Romans you know you think God was up to something there um you can go to Bethlehem today and again, do we know the exact place? We're pretty close. The church of um, the nativity is, 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 is pretty close. Why? Because the first, second century, first and second century writers, the, the early church fathers, talked about, they knew when Jesus was alive, where he was born. They knew after his resurrection where he's, it was only 30 miles from Jerusalem. And so they were able to say, oh, this is where it was. This is where it was. So they have a pretty good idea, they're, they're really close into the ballpark. Would I put my money on it that it's ex- that exact spot? No, but it's really close. Over and over again, you can go and see the places, not just where he was born, but where he performed miracles, where he wept, where he was put on trial, where he was crucified. We can have confidence that Jesus is not a myth. He's not a philosophy. He's not a legend. He's a real savior who lived in real time. 
And that makes all the difference because sometimes the reason that we lack confidence, a confident joy is we wonder, is God involved in history now? Yeah, we can understand that God is involved in an upper story to accomplish some like spiritual, ethereal things. But what about the lower story? What about our story? Some people have this deistic view of God basically that says, well, God's, you kind of separate history from spirituality. God is up here and we're down here. That's not the Christmas story, is it? Don't you love the fact that it tells us Augustus Caesar, arguably the greatest Caesar who ever lived, <laughs> sends out a decree. Everybody needs to be registered throughout the Roman Empire. That decree makes its way to the shores of Palestine where the Jewish people don't like obeying the emperor makes its way, you know, so you expect they're going to be delaying a bit. They're going to put this off as long as they can. It makes its way to the hill country of Galilee, makes its way to the top of this hill called Nazareth, makes its way to Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph now have to make the 80-mile journey south of Jerusalem to Bethlehem where their son Jesus is born to fulfill a prophecy made 700 years before by the prophet Micah, because God had told Micah, say this thing, in Bethlehem, the Savior will be born. Good old Caesar thought he was in control, and he was in control. And he did a lot of good and a lot of bad, which would have not been God's will, although he was better than Claudius Caligula or Nero later on. But... <laughs> this Caesar who thinks he's controlling things doesn't realize God is sovereign and God is using his decree at just the right time to make just the right things happen in just the right place. Because God is a God who works in history. God is a God who's at work in your life and mine as well. Which is why it's encouraging for us to hear Jesus say, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. He is the savior of history. He is the savior of our world at work today. That means we can have confident hope, confident joy. No matter who wins elections. Ugh. No matter who wins, oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my friend Bob who... I was rooting for. No matter who wins elections, God is still on his throne. No matter how popular skepticism gets, no matter how popular anti-Christ teaching becomes, no matter how dark the world gets, no matter how discouraged your world becomes, we can have a confident joy because God is not aloof somewhere. He is still at work in our lives. He is still the good shepherd who leads us. Therefore, we have all of our needs met. We have confident joy because he's an historic savior. We also have a confident joy because he's a redeeming savior. Is there anything that haunts us, that robs our joy quite like guilt and shame. Psychologists tell us that guilt and shame lead to depression and isolation and anger and anxiety and even paranoia. Just kind of neg automatically negative because of your own guilt and shame, insecurity. Famed psychiatrist Carl Menninger once said, if he could convince his patients that their sins were forgiven, he thought as many as 75% of them could be healed the next day. We're hounded by our guilt. Motivational speaker Denise Duffield Thomas says, guilt is one of the most common feelings women suffer. She says, I feel guilty about everything. Already today, there we go. I'm with you, yeah. It's my first, it is my, it is one of my first emotions. If I do something good, I feel guilty that I didn't do it better or sooner or somebody else could have done it better right? She says, already today I feel guilty about having said the wrong thing to a friend, and now I feel guilty about avoiding that friend because I said that wrong thing. I haven't called my mother today. Guilty. I gave the wrong kind of food to my child, I'm sure. Guilty. 
I've been cutting corners at work lately, guilty. I skipped breakfast this morning, guilty. I snacked instead, double guilty. I look at my whole life and just think guilty, guilty, guilty. Nor am I feeling good about feeling bad. Poor me, guilty about feeling guilty. Filial guilt, fraternal guilt, spousal guilt, maternal guilt, peer guilt. Anybody identifying with any of these guilts? What guilt would you add? Work guilt, middle class guilt, white guilt, historical guilt, Jewish guilt. I'm guilty of them all, she says. That's why I love what the Apostle Paul says. I can identify with Romans chapter 7 where Paul says, the good I want to do, I don't do. Guilty. The bad I don't want to do, that I do. Guilty. Who will rescue me from this body of death? But thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why can't I be joyful and confident in my joy? Because my guilt has been removed by a Savior. The angel says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of your shame. Do not be, you don't have to be afraid of your guilt. I proclaim to you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. Anybody here feel like you are the exception? God can forgive everybody else, but I'm not sure he'll forgive me. Today in the city of David, a Savior is born to you. If Jesus is your Savior, you can have confident joy if your joy and your confidence is in him. See, the problem that I, I often inf- find when talking to people is they don't really they don't really believe they need to have their confidence in Jesus' forgiveness for them to be confident in joy. A lot of people today, if, I, if you have a conversation, why, why do you think you'll go to heaven, will say, well, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. You know, I, I don't think that God's going to reject me because I've done a lot of good things. And I really have a hard time helping them understand it's not the good things that get us into heaven, it's the bad things that keep us out from heaven. It's really hard for people to understand. Try that. I have an experiment for you to try if that's, if, 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 if you're having a hard time getting your arms, getting your hands around that one. Go today and wreck your car. Okay, don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt somebody else. Wreck your, in fact, better yet, wreck somebody else's car. Okay, just take your, I had somebody first service say, I'll wreck my son's car. Yeah, whatever. Um, and then go to counseling afterward to reconcile. But um, re- go wreck a car. Wreck it well. Okay, I mean, do a thorough job so you have to get a wrecker to come and take your car to the repair shop. And then I want you to go to the repair guy and say, if you're like my age, you could say, hey, I want you to know something. I'm actually a really good driver. In, the, in my whole lifetime, I, I have never totaled my car before. I've maybe had a couple of fender benders, but I'm a really good driver. 99.5% of the time, I am an excellent driver. I haven't even had a ticket for years. I am a great driver. Do you think that's going to impress the repair guy? Do you think the repair guy is going to say, well, that's great. I guess your car doesn't need repaired. No, your repair guy is going to say, well, that's really nice for you. But the reality is that's not going to get your car drivable and somebody has to pay for the repair. And yet we think we can stand before God who's given us this car, this life. And maybe 99% of the time you're a really good person. I doubt it, but let's just for sake of an argument. Um, Because I know I'm not. Um, But then we stand before God and think of all the times we've wrecked the car. Every impure thought, every selfish motivation and action, every time we have hurt somebody intentionally or unintentionally, every time we've done something bad or not done done something good and taken responsibility that we should have, every lustful idea, every deception, Everything has wrecked the car, just running into tree after another, after another. And now we're standing before God one day and we're saying, and here God is looking at us in our wrecked car and we're going to say to him, but God, most of my life, I was a good driver. You know, you think God's, no, what's God going to say? He said, well, that's wonderful. But there are only 
perfect drivers with perfect cars in my heaven. And the problem, the issue is not what a wonderful driver you were most of the time. The issue is you're, you're a wrecked car and it needs to get repaired and somebody has to pay. That is why it's so wonderful when John the Baptist first sees Jesus in the book of John, he points and he says to those who will listen, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now that doesn't mean nearly as much to us as it would have meant to those Jewish people because they understood immediately they would have been transformed, trans, tr transitioned all the way back to the time of Moses in Egypt to the 10th plague. God has been trying to get Pharaoh to let the people free, his people free. And Pharaoh's resisting. And so God sends the final plague, uh, angel of death. The angel of death is going to come through Egypt and kill the firstborn of every family, firstborn person, firstborn animal. But for the people of Israel, God provides a way out. He says to them, go find a lamb and sacrifice the lamb that you will use in your feast. And take the blood of that lamb and paint the doorposts with the blood of that lamb. And when the angel, the death angel comes by and he's doing justice everywhere. He's requiring a life for the sins. He will come to your house and he will not see you in your sin. He will see the blood of the lamb covering your house and he will pass over your house and you will be free. He will see you as his children. You know, Jesus was born, but Jesus was crucified at Passover, right? And every time the people of Israel celebrated Passover, they remembered, we're covered by the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb takes away the sins of the world. And now John points at Jesus and says, <laughs> he's the Passover Lamb. Now, those of us who accept Jesus as Savior, stand before God someday when death comes to our lives and, and God will not see us in our brokenness, in our sin. He will see the blood of the Lamb covering us and we'll be free. We will, he will see we are His children that's why we sing, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, blessed is the flow that makes me white as snow. Where are you going to go to find confident joy that your sins are washed away, that you are covered? You're going to put confidence in yourself? That's why I say to people as you're facing life and, and death, I tell you, I wouldn't have confidence facing eternity in my own goodness but I have so much confidence knowing I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb. Where else can you go to be made white as snow? You can't find it in Islam. Talk to your Muslim friends as I've talked to mine and ask them, do you know you're going to be forgiven by Allah? They'll say no. Unless you die in jihad, you hope for the mercy of Allah, but you cannot know for sure. There is no blood of the Lamb to cover in Islam in Buddhism and Hinduism, it's the same. There's no substitutionary sacrifice in, in karma. Although I do think it's interesting, those of you who are world travelers, I know we have a bunch in Thailand, they have an expression in Thai. There is no substitutionary sacrifice in Buddhism. There is, they don't know where this precedent comes from, but they actually have a phrase in Thai, which is, the lamb who takes sin. There's no placement of sin on another in Thai theology, in Buddhist theology. Where does that come from? God's been communicating himself 
throughout the world to all generations. And you can know His freedom today. You can know His forgiveness because you know Jesus as your Savior. Where else can you turn? Somebody said if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent an economist. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent a Savior in the city of David, the Lamb of God who takes away your sins and mine. Somebody has to pay for the repair. Jesus did. Are you confident? Do you have a confident joy? Because your confidence is in Jesus to redeem you. Finally, we can have a confident joy because we have a powerful Savior. A Savior has been born for you who is the Messiah, the Lord. That word Messiah means anointed one. The king would be anointed in those days. The king, you see, is the one who comes to reign. He is the, come, he is the one who comes to change everything, to direct us. John 1 speaks of Jesus. He says, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. Jesus is not just a Savior who washes away our sins. He is a Savior who is our life, who changes our lives. If we let him, 2 Corinthians 5.16 says, Therefore, if anybody is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. See, the new has come. Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ. Notice both times the, the pronoun there used is, is Christ. The emphasis, you see, is anointed one. Jesus is the king, the unique king. There's no universal Christ. That stuff is being taught by heretics these days. Jesus is the Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. What do you feel stuck in today? Everybody feels stuck sometimes. Stuck in fear, stuck in habits, stuck in some pattern, stuck in anger. Boy, there are a lot of people that are stuck in bitterness. Stuck in a relationship that just won't change. In Christ, he makes us a new creation. Stuck in grief, the old has gone. He wants to give you new life today. I can talk about that, but I think you won't really get it as much until you actually see people who've experienced it and can tell you from their own experience. Our friends at I Am Second have a remarkable number of interviews that they've done um, watch these interviews. Watch how, watch how Christ is a, brings a new creation to people in all situations. Think about how you're stuck and how you want their story to be your story. Let's watch this together, please. The celebration of Christmas is that God came into this world to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Anybody stuck? Anybody connect with those people like I do? Don't wait for perfection. Don't wait till you're perfectly ready. Don't wait till you perfectly understand everything. You're never perfectly ready. You never perfectly understand. Today can be a day of the new start where, this, where the healing begins. But first you have to surrender to Jesus. And, and then you say, Jesus, surrender means I need you to do this through me. Do this in me. And he will. Will you surrender what you have, what you can to Jesus today? I want to close with this picture. It's a picture of my four-year-old grandson, Oliver. And we can all go, ooh, ah, he is the cutest little boy you've ever seen. I know. Uh, thank you very much. Four years old, um, they, he and his mom and dad um, made this gingerbread train and just a couple of weeks ago. And boy, was he excited when it was done. He told me secretly, he said, I sneaked some of the candy while we were making it. <laughs> he was pretty excited about that. But I looked at that picture and I thought, parents... 
how much is that kind of joy worth to you? How much is it worth to, have, to give your kids that kind of joy? I, I looked at this. I'm so, I'm proud of my son, the kind of husband that he is and kind of dad that he is. I'm proud of my, I, my daughter-in-law is the best mom in the world because when I look at that picture, you know what I see? I see a little boy who knows he's loved. You ask Oliver, Oliver, you know you're loved. He says, yeah, I know. I see a little boy who's received a lot of sacrifice. There are many who have sacrificed a lot so he could have this joy. Every parent knows what it means to sacrifice for your children so they can have joy. I want you to know today, see this picture? God has this picture of you. There's nothing that God won't do. There's nothing that he won't sacrifice so you can be filled with confident joy. He has done everything. He has sacrificed everything he possibly can because he loves you more than any parent has ever loved a child. And he wants for you joy more than any parent has ever wanted joy for a child. The only thing left is will you receive it? Will you receive Jesus as Savior so you know the joy of sins forgiven, purpose for life, hope for eternity, and so you'll know the joy of becoming a new creation in Him every day. What's your next step? For some, you need to surrender to Jesus today for the first time and be baptized. For some, if you're not in a Bible discussion group, I, I don't, it's very, very difficult to grow all by yourself. You need to serve in some way. You need to share the joy with somebody else so the joy increases. What's your next step? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we would take our next step with you right now. I pray for those who are, who are at this moment hearing your voice very clearly, calling them to first-time surrender. Not to perfect surrender. Not to you know, everything on us, but just to say, we know we need salvation. We know we need Jesus. Lord, help. May they be baptized today. For those who are followers of Christ, we live in a world that is really dark and absent of so much joy. May we be the joy of Christ in this time. Through Christ we pray. Amen.